Our next speaker is Zeba Rahman, Senior Program Officer with the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art. Zeba manages the Foundation's Building Bridges program, which she'll tell us more about. She also oversees Duke's Building Demand for the Arts in Initiative, which supports joint efforts by organizations. That has actually changed. Okay. <laughs> Zeba no longer support. Uh, before joining the foundation, she led internationally and nationally recognized projects as creative director and producer, including the Fez Festival of World Sacred Music in Morocco, as artistic director of Arts Midwest's Caravanserai, a place where cultures meet, as curator with BAM's Mike Ch Check Hip Hop, creative consultant for public programs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and chief curator of Alliance Francaise World Nomads Morocco Festival. Uh, she's an advisor to Artworks for Freedom on the nominating committee of the Civitella Ranieri Foundation and an advisor to PBS's Sacred, a documentary series. Zeba Rahman. Thank you. Zeba Rahman, who's very challenged technically, is going to try and pull up her presentation. I may, I may ask for help. Um, the Mothership, as I call it, is the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. And uh, within that, there are three operating foundations, including Duke Farms, which is uh, a seasonal home of Doris Duke, um, and the Newport Restoration Foundation, which is um, another home of Doris Duke's um, and is, houses her European art collection. It's now a house museum, and it also has the Restoration Foundation, which takes care of the preservation of all the Newport mansions um, and a lot of the historic homes. And it's something that Doris started while she was alive. She was very concerned about the, the state of, of these mansions. Um, and she started funding the, the preservation of them. And that continues today. And then there's the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art, which um, has two parts to it. One of them is uh, Shangri-La, her seasonal home in Honolulu. And what happened with Doris is that um, she went on her first honeymoon in the 1930s for a year. Um, and she must have started in Europe. Yes. She must have started in Europe. She must have ended up in Morocco. I'm just guessing at this. And then began a journey through the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, and ended up in South Asia at what um, was then India, and now is India and Pakistan. Uh, and she completely fell in love as she went along with all these regions and just stayed months and months with her new husband um, and started buying art. Um, and then they, on the way back, ended up um, in Honolulu and were going to go back to mother-in-law's place in Florida and build their house next to mom-in-law and, and start their lives. But in fact, she fell so hard for Honolulu that she decided that she was going to build a home there and indeed bought a plot of land on five acres of Diamond Head, um, which is one of the best parts in Honolulu, and built this incredible home uh, based on Islamic architecture. And that house was uh, completed in 1937 um, and is now also a house museum in partnership with the Honolulu Museum of Art. Um, and has her substantial collection um, and an important collection of art, more than 2,500 objects. Um, uh, and it's now um, an educational center and a study center. There's a scholars in residence, an artists in residence program. Um, they have um, a curatorial conservation program in partnership with the university, or I should say we have, uh, because they're my uh, colleagues. And um, also convenings, Hillary Clinton had um, a, um, a meeting there um, for uh, foreign ministers some years ago. And, and uh, there are other groups um, that, that have convenings there as well. It's quite beautiful. Um, Doris collected um, Islamic art for more than 60 years. And she, uh, not only in region, here she is, by the way. It's one of my favorite pictures of Doris. Well. Um, this is in 1933, um, she, this is Moti Masjid in, in India, um, uh, the Pearl Mosque, and uh, it really, um, you know, she went back to it again and again over, over her life. She collected art both in region 
And she also bought art at auctions in the West and very often went up against the v the Victorian Albert Museum and the Metropolitan Museum, sometimes winning, sometimes losing. Um, and I mean, the other thing that she was really concerned about, and she said this in her will, that she was very concerned about improving the quality of people's lives. Um, she was interested in the world around her and, and, and um, had a keen eye for beauty as well and a, a keen concern for the quality of people's lives. And it's something that you were saying, Alberta, um, about values and attitudes, cultural values and attitudes, and, and how they inform us. And Doris was really ahead of her time um, in that way. She, uh, among other things, uh, funded um, uh, planned parenthood contraception in the 1930s at a time where you can imagine the reaction. Um, so she's quite uh, forward thinking and, and a visionary in that way. Okay, right. I just need to get to my notes. That's the main thing. I wanted to show you a picture of Shangri-La as well. This is an aerial view, oops, no, it's not on screen. Anyway, moving right along. Um, sorry about this. Um, so the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art has these two parts, it's Shangri-La, as I said, and then in New York, there's the grant making, national grant making program, uh, which I take care of, called Building Bridges. And Building Bridges has been in a state of evolution. It started in 2007, uh, where the board really felt that it needed to activate um, grant making in the wake of 9-11 and, and the aftermath. And um, it's, um, the program was, was managed at that time by a, a part-time consultant. It was to get it going. And those were staff-selected grants that um, uh, Nadia Romani, who was, who was at the, mm -hmm. the um, uh, Bellagio meeting uh, a couple of years ago, um, took care of. And, and then in 2013, uh, the board approved a full-time in-house position, and there was a national search, and I was fortunate enough to get selected for it. So we're under strategic review, and we moved from, um, at this point, from uh, focusing on supporting projects that um, help to shift perceptions of Muslims to a more expansive um, uh, position of supporting projects to help shift perceptions of Muslims, but also to build communities, to build interactions between Muslim and non-Muslim communities. In the US, we're a national program. Um, and uh, both inter and intra, because even within the Muslim community, the American Muslim community, which is diverse and, um, and growing, uh, very often somebody from Senegal may not necessarily know anything or interact with someone, the African American Muslim community, for instance. So there's, there's a disconnect, and we're very interested in creating those connections and those relationships. Um, and then, of course, Muslim and non-Muslim communities. That's, that's, that continues to be um, of interest. And then the other, other um, point, to engage and educate media, which is um, to tell those stories to help support um, the, the shift in perceptions from negative to um, more realistic and, and positive in most cases. So what happened in 2013 is that we moved from just staff-selected grants to, to two competitive initiatives. One of them is managed in-house uh, in New York, and the other is managed by the Association of Performing Arts Presenters, which is an art service organization based in Washington, D.C., um, and that is the campus community engagement. So I'm going to focus on, on the campus community engagement for, for this talk because um, that's, that's part of my assignment is to t tell you about uh, community engagement. Um, it's also, it's, uh, it's a pilot initiative that is still unfolding. And what we did is we support six um, educational and cultural institutions that are focused on campuses throughout the US. Uh, and they are um, 
doing very interesting projects. One of them is the University of Southern Florida in partnership with a nonprofit organization called Art to Action. Um, and Art to Action were, is um, led by Andrea Asaf, who's um, American Lebanese, and she's not Muslim, she's Christian. Um, and she's in residence at the University of Southern Florida. Uh, she's a theater maker. But she's also brought in um, a certain general who uh, served in, in Afghanistan and, and Iraq, and he's, he's become the advocate for this program because in Tampa, Florida, there's a very large uh, central command. It's a very conservative community, and there are a lot of vets. There are also a lot of refugees from the Muslim, Muslim um, regions there. Um, Iraqis primarily, Afghanis, um, and now Syrians. So um, it's, it's a, a really hot mix of populations. And Andrea has used devised theater to, to really start working with the different communities uh, with this general as an advocate. And she's also working with the veterans who have returned with PTSD. Um, so it's, it's a, a fascinating um, what, how that, that project is evolving. The other one is um, in New York, a, a community college, which is part of the City University of New York, one of the large public institutions, uh, for those of you who are not American. Um, and it has a population, it's based in Queens, and it has a population primarily of taxi drivers um, who are from all over the world, and they're there to study English. Um, so they're the taxi drivers, and then they're those who are going through nursing school, um, or nursing um, associates degrees, uh, junior college degrees, and, um, and other immigrants. So it's, it's a large institution, this community college. Um, they're th those who are there to study technical skills um, and, and those to study English. And their art center commissioned Ping Chong, who's um, Chinese and American colleagues will, will know that name. He, Ping was just honored by Obama at the White House for his work in device theater. And um, he uh, was commissioned by LaGuardia Community College's Art Center to work with um, Muslim students um, whose families are immigrants to create a work called Beyond Sacred. And it unpacks um, Muslim identities and, and they, they debuted the work in New York um, with five students, uh, an Afghani, uh, um, uh, Egyptian, South Asian, Caribbean, and, and African American, telling, and what they did is they, they took their stories, their real stories, and wove it into this work. And then these students are on stage actually um, reciting their own words. So it's, it's been a, a, a fascinating, really authentic, really powerful project um, that is being seen by a, a large cross-section of society and it's going to start touring. Um, and they plan to continue this work of device theater and, and working with immigrant communities. Um, and the third project, um, which I, I also wanted to share with you, is um, uh, done at a cultural center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And um, there is, uh, Mike will know, and maybe Asad will know, the Cedar Cultural Center, which is really, uh, for music heads, a world music uh, venue. Um, they do s several hundred shows a year, and they've been around for many years. They have a small theater of maybe about 500, four or 500 uh, seats, roughly. So it's not a large venue, but what the Cedar did is it, it took the initiative um, to apply for this grant, they weren't quite a fit because they weren't on campus, but they were near a campus. They, were, they are situated in what is known as Little Mogadishu, um, which has the largest Somali refugee population, out, you know, and the largest Somali population now outside Somalia. It's very poor. It's in the um, Cedar Riverside um, housing complex, which is public housing. and. Um, they're also near a small, private, primarily white Christian college called Oxford College. And so the CEDA partnered with the community and with Oxford College to 
um, to do a project called Midnimo, which in Somali means unity, and it's based on uh, music, Somali music. And if you follow the politics of Somalia and the Sahel, the sub-Saharan belt, um, you may know that 25 years ago, an Islamist government came in um, after great unrest, and since then, music is banned, um, live music is banned, because they can consider it haram. Um, not acceptable, not permissible by Islam. So a whole generation has grown up without having the experience of heard live music. They know YouTube clips, they, they, they know taped music, and the culture has changed um, so much for, for this community that the grandparents and parents know live music, but the kids do not. Um, and so in the way it's playing out in Little Mogadishu, is that when their weddings or other community celebrations, the kids only know um, taped music or, or, um, or from the digital space. And when they have weddings, for instance, um, they will have um, people get up and lip sync to, to uh, taped music because they, they don't have that experience. They don't have a point of reference at all. So what the, all this to say that the CEDA came in and said, we want to share live music with this community and also with the Augsburg College community of, of this very, very um, um, white population and um, a retired music teacher, retired faculty member at Augsburg took it upon himself to bring his former music students and some of his current music students um, to the CEDA to meet the Somali community, um, to to really construct live music, um, you know, with horns, with Western horns and, and drums and so on. And he transcribed a lot of the traditional music um, so that the students, his students learned it uh, because the Somali community, while it has vocalists, does not have instrumentalists. It's gone away, it's just gone away. In, it's similar to Cambodia, actually, in, in that way. I was thinking of the Pol Pot regime, and, and they killed 90% of the intellectuals and, and artists, right? And they had to reconstruct their culture. So Somalia has a similar trajectory. Um, and the CEDA became the hub for reviving the culture. Um, well, since then, um, the Somali government has heard about the project, and they're very interested to know um, why it's so successful, first of all, very curious about that, and then how they can, can learn from this model. Um, because what happened is that, that the local uh, Somali population, once they started to go into the CEDA, they'd never been, by the way, um, in, into the CEDA center. They, they went in, they had a really positive experience, they, they we're standing side by side with, with students from Augsburg College and other, other world music heads, basically, um, listening to the music live and, and um, had such a profound experience that, that um, they want to come uh, more and more and have more programs of, of Somali culture at the Cedar. Um, and just let me know about time. Okay. We're good on the tech for now. I just left the, <laughs> the presentation, I keep going. Um, and so the government um, has reached out through the community to, to the CEDAR. Um, they've also got calls from the State Department because they want to know how this model is working. Um, and the local government in Minneapolis has asked the CEDAR to um, work with them on programming for summer festivals to bring some of this uh, music into, into the parks in Minneapolis, um, and the state government ha has invited them to tour some of the, the musicians that they're working with. And they also recently got a grant from the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation. It's the, the uh, for those of you who are, who are not American, it's, it's um, Blue Cross Blue Shield is our, our um, health, a large health organization. And they have a foundation, and they, they fund, obviously, public health. But in this case, they funded the CEDA to continue the work that we supported, that Building Bridges supported, um, because they were very interested in the mental health outcomes um, for the Somali community. And then 
um, Augsburg College, which has um, a nursing program, um, got the nursing program had got interested because she thought that her students would be going out and, and serving the, the Somali population and that they should really learn more about the culture to be more sensitive um, and to deepen their understanding. So, so lots of interesting um, preliminary outcomes have come from this project. Um, more than anything else, um, the Cedar Augsburg um, student population and faculty and the little Mogadishu population have really got to know each other for the first time through this initiative, through this project. Um, so it's, it's um, for us, been a, a, a really successful, really interesting experiment. Um, and, and the CEDA is transformed by it. They, they're committed to continuing with the work. Um, so that's on that. In terms of, of um, Tom, and, and Michael asked me to talk about some of the challenges uh, to the work that we support, uh, the ongoing challenge is that, um, like the NEA, um, we are relatively small as a program, um, and certainly the smallest at um, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, um, and, and yet we turn out to be the largest in the US. Um, the largest ongoing program, um, which tells you a little bit about the situation in the U.S. Um, but uh, what we are doing is actively um, seeking out partnerships, um, both internally within, within the foundation, with the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, the arts program, the child well-being program, um, our communications department and, and others. Is, uh, I, I was saying, I think I was saying it to Michael, I said I can't remember, that um, in a way I feel a little bit back, like uh, the Peanuts character, you know, Pig Ben, um, taking my blankie from office to office, <laughs> kicking up dirt and saying, will you partner with us, will you partner with us? And doing the same thing externally with colleagues. Um, because really partnerships is, uh, are the way forward for the Building Bridges program. So it's an ongoing challenge. Um, and then there's a challenge of what Alberta said about sustaining the, the um, I mean, for the institutions, empowering the institutions to sustain the work. Um, this is a huge issue in the US. Uh, Mike and I were talking about, about uh, the tax base in, in the US versus Europe, and that there's a difference. We're a market-driven um, economy, and it's, uh, we're structured differently from Europe. Um, we don't have a <coughs> Department of Culture or Minister of Culture. We have the State Department. Um, so uh, that's good and that's bad both. Um, it's hard on the institutions, um, and very often these projects tend to become one-offs. In the case of the Cedar Cultural Center, so many um, players have taken interest that they are continuing with the work, and it has transformed that institution. Um, on the ground, um, coming down from the funder aerial view to the earthworm view, you know, um, from, from my former life as, as a producer and creative director, uh, the biggest challenges for those doing this work is, is managing the visa situation. It's, it's uh, an ongoing challenge. You, you've said it, I'll bet many of you in the room know it. It's an ongoing challenge. Um, and the other thing that we don't have is what you at Chimeta have is, is uh, mobility funds. It's not something that's very popular in the US. Um, our, uh, oddly enough, uh, we're, we're a large country, and at the same time, we don't really have um, the capacity for practitioners to go and look at each other's work to, to uh, interact. Um, I've talked about the Chimeta Fund internally and externally after we met uh, in Tunis a couple of years ago, um, but somehow it, that hasn't taken hold, that hasn't become a priority. Artists need to connect with each other, um, practitioners need to connect with each other, institutions need to connect with each other um, to break out of the silos that uh, they find themselves in. Um, and the other thing on the, back to the community side of things, um, and uh, separate from, from the practical, is that there is really a need for the larger um, population 
in this, this shifting scene of demogra demographics in the US to understand um, what you called plural identities. Um, that, that there is a multiplicity of identity in the US, um, which is, which is um, something that people are grappling with. It's, it's a naughty problem that requires more um, interaction between people, more uh, knowledge building, and um, uh, we're all in this together. And I, I think we need to, to really cooperate, find ways to cooperate, find ways to build relationships, and move forward as one. I'll stop there, because I've totally left my notes and I've riffed <laughs> off. <laughs> there we are, I think I'm well out of time. That was fantastic. You plowed through. <laughs> uh, I, 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 think it sh I think it shows that we can connect better through culture than we can through technology sometimes. Um, we're going to take a very brief break uh, so that we can set up for our next speakers. And if everyone would be back in their seats in no less than 10 minutes.